Hey everybody, Ron Bielefeld with Sling Wings Photography. I need to be really quiet. I'm in a hide, in a blind right now. And I'm hoping to photograph a species I've been trying to get real, get close to and get good images of for a long, long time. It's a very rare species. And so if you want to know what it is, I'm at his cavity, at its cavity hoping it's going to come out and hold on just a second just a minute it might be coming out and I want to get some video so just hold on a second here this species that's super rare See if I can get in there. Oh, oh, he's coming out. He's coming out of his. Oh, there he is. There he is. I've been waiting a lifetime to get this species. It's the Angorian owl. So called because he's got fur like feathers that are super soft, like an Angora sweater, like an Angora rabbit. It's the Angorian owl. So anyway, there it is. And the reason why I finally got close to this bird is because I learned about this bird. I learned its habitats. I learned its, stop recording here. I learned its behavior, where it likes to nest, stuff like that. So this is my fifth installment of my Getting Better Birds in Flight video series. And this is part of it. It's kind of an ancillary part of it, but you gotta know where to find the birds. You gotta know their behavior. You gotta know when they're gonna be there. So if you wanna know how you can improve your birds in flight imagery, getting close to the birds, knowing the birds, stay tuned. So we're talking about knowing your subjects. In this case, knowing your birds and knowing your birds in relation to getting better bird and flight images, even of not so real birds like my Angorian owl in the introduction. But it is important. This is kind of ancillary, like I said in the, in the introduction. It's not about getting the images of the birds in flight themselves, but it's going to help you find and get close to the birds that you want to photograph in flight as far as knowing your birds uh, goes. And like I also said, this isn't so much about ID of birds. It's kind of a prerequisite to bird photography, at least to me. I like to know what I'm photographing or if I see a bird, I like to be able to identify it right off the bat. And of course, that's a learning process. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about bird ID. I will mention a couple resources uh, that I like for bird ID and helping you learn birds. And that'll come up in just a minute. But this is really about learning the behaviors of birds learning how to find the birds and when it comes to behaviors getting down to the nitty-gritty about individual distinct behaviors that will help you anticipate a bird's behavior actions movements including flying of course and that's going to help you get better bird in flight images because you're going to be able to anticipate what the bird's going to do so let's talk a little bit first about ID. That's really some of the fun, some of the best enjoyment that you're going to get out of your bird photography, I think, is being able to know what your 
actually photographing, so bird ID is important. There are a lot of resources out there for bird ID. Some of the uh, older ways of doing it, uh, field guides, this is the National Geographic Field Guide to North American Birds, and uh, one for Europe, uh, Princeton, I believe, Princeton Field Guides here. So I find the written guide still to be pretty useful and I like to take them on trips with me when I'm going into areas that may have different species that I'm that I'm used to seeing. Of course your phone and the applications, the apps that you can get on your phones these days are great. I've got a whole group here on my iPhone having to do with photography and on there there's the iBird Ultimate there's uh, Merlin Bird ID, which is really awesome. If you're trying to ID a bird, you can actually punch in characteristics of the bird, location, time of year, and it will narrow down the species for you that, m that, it, that the bird might be. It helps you identify the bird much quicker. So those types of resources for bird ID are out there. If you just Google bird ID on your computer, you're going to come up with a whole load of resources that are going to help you potentially uh, get good or better at uh, IDing birds. One big part of getting flight images of birds is knowing generally where to look for specific species and there are some great resources out there for that as well. One really good one is eBird. If you haven't ever used eBird online on your phone, you can get it on your phone, you can get it on your desktop, you can get it on your laptop. I think there's even some vehicles that have it built into their navigation system and stuff now, so it's crazy. But eBird is awesome because it provides species specific maps to where birds have been seen recently or it gives dates at least for several years going back about where certain species have been located and these maps get really detailed down to specific points or markers on the map and so I really love eBird for uh, finding the general locations of where a bird that I would like to photograph photograph in flight hopefully uh, might be hanging out other resources Local Audubon chapters are great. Contact uh, those folks. They can tell you uh, where a certain species might be hanging out or what species have been in the area recently. Uh, local residents, if you know someone in the area that you're wanting to photograph, they'll probably be able to tell you some things. If they're birders, they can get out or bird photographers, of course, they, they get out in the field, they can help you out. So again, there's a lot of resources for narrowing down where you might find birds that you want to photograph and like we're talking about here photograph and flight once you're on the ground it can be difficult i'm going to use a, a species around here that is somewhat popular because it's rarish it's the bachman sparrow so you could use eBird and find where Bachman sparrows have been seen recently, but once you get out in the field, in this case it's going to be like pine flatwoods type habitat, open grassy areas with sparse pine trees, we call that pine flatwoods here in Florida. Once you get out into that habitat, it all looks pretty similar. And so these birds do have specific types of habitat that they like to use, especially during different times of the year. And it can all look the same to us. It doesn't all look the same to them. So what can help you narrow in where these birds are? Knowing what they sound like. Knowing the birds' songs and calls can really help you. Once you're on the ground, if you hear one and if you know what it sounds like, of course, that's going to help you narrow uh, the search pattern quite a bit, and you're going to be able to get much, much closer to the bird you're going to want to, uh, that you're trying to photograph. So I really like knowing bird songs. It's tough to learn a lot of these bird songs rapidly. Some people are really good at it. Some people, it takes some time. There's really no quick way to do it other than to study and resources for bird songs are very similar to general resources out there for learning bird ID in general. The, uh, a lot of the apps that we just talked about on the phone can uh, provide songs for all those species. 
the field guides a lot of times have uh, at least a written out version of what the bird song or call sound like. I've not really found that those have been very useful for me. I much prefer to be able to hear it. So learning calls via recordings of the birds calls is really a good way to go. That's kind of the homework you have to do. But I'll tell you, there's no substitute for getting out in the field and hearing these birds sing and call and being able to then identify them. It's much easier when all you're hearing is a recording of one species. But if you've ever been out in the morning during breeding season or in the late evenings during breeding season, you have lots of different species that are calling. And it can be very difficult because a lot of the calls, warblers, for example, and yes, you can photograph warblers in flight. It's difficult, but it can be done. But warblers, for example, they're all singing. You might have five or six species in an area singing at the same time. Some of them, their, their songs are very similar, the males, because that's the bird that's generally calling and singing, it can be very similar. And it can be very difficult to identify individual species if you haven't had the experience in the field. So there's really no substitute for getting out in the field, taking that homework, learning the individual calls, going out in the field, then trying to identify them in the field. Once you get good at identifying birds, songs, and calls, you're going to find that finding these birds, getting into an area that's going to allow you to potentially get these birds and get them uh, photographed while they're in flight is going to go up. You've got to get to the birds first, and that's one way um, that that will help you in being able to know and identify the bird when you hear them. The Merlin app on your phone is really, really a good app for songs, and it also will help you actually identify the song of a bird if you can get close enough to it, there's an actual bird ID by song part of that app. And you can hit the button and it will actually listen, record that bird and tell you pretty well. And it does a pretty good job tell you which species you're listening to. That can be another great way to um, identify uh, and learn than the songs of birds. Once you're in the general area where the bird is, it starts to be important to learn their individual behaviors. And all these different species have different behaviors. And again, like learning the bird ID, learning the bird songs, this takes time. You can watch videos. One of the really great resources I found for learning about birds in general, where they are in the world, when and when they're there, during what time of the annual cycle, be it uh, breeding time, migrational periods, wintering periods, and then knowing the types of habitats that they, they use, and then also uh, knowing a little bit about their individual behaviors is a, a source called Birds of the World. It's by Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It used to be Birds of North America. They've expanded it now to Birds of the World. And it's a subscription, so you have to pay a little bit of money to get the full use of this resource. But if you use it, it is one of the best resources for just learning about the specific species that you're interested in. And I'll tell you, it's based on research, data-driven research that, I'll tell you, a lot of work went into uh, most of the species accounts in there. And there are thousands of species from all over the world. I happen to have written one of the accounts for the Florida model duck in Birds of the World. So I know firsthand the amount of effort, data, that goes into these accounts. So they can be a wealth of information trying to learn more about your birds. The next step in getting better, learning your birds' behaviors, the habitats that they use, things like that, um, is spending time with these individual species There's that you're interested in. There's no 
substitute again homework is great it's going to help but you have to get out in the field you have to watch these individual birds these individual species to get to understand how they use their habitats and once you know the bird better you will be able to anticipate where the bird's going to be and you're going to be able to start to identify behaviors that are going to tell you allow you to predict and anticipate when they're going to do certain behaviors so again getting out spending time with the birds learning for example songbirds they're creatures of habit most birds are creatures of habit they're going to have specific perches that they like to go to every morning or every evening whenever they're singing they're going to go to these perches being out in the field is the only way to find these perches it's a behavior that once you get out and watch these birds hopefully you're going to be able to recognize then maybe the next morning you're going to be able to get in front of and close to one of these uh, male uh, males perches when he starts to sing and he's going to be there singing for you and then of course you're going to know maybe where he goes from there to different perches so you're going to anticipate the flight of the bird and be able to get him jumping off the perch if it's a small songbird or something like that and get your bird in flight uh, shots that way it's really a great thing to the more you understand the individual behaviors of individual species and even of individual birds the more you're going to be able to anticipate what the bird's going to do these individual behaviors call them tells because they tell you ahead of time what the bird might do good chance good probability that they're going to do it just before they do it and things like i'm going to use an example here of uh, diving belted kingfishers they have a towel that allows you to anticipate when they're going to dive one of their towels is when they're on a perch and they're looking down at the water they have a, a membrane that they close over their eyes which is called a nictitating membrane when they start to close that often rapidly that means they've probably seen a fish and they're interested in that fish and they may dive pretty quickly another thing that they do is that they take their crest feathers and they put them down against their head they don't raise them up they put them down and they make themselves basically as aerodynamic and as flat as possible at the same time that they do that they generally deflate all of their air sacs because they want to be as aerodynamic like a dart going through the air and when they hit the water they don't want to be buoyant per se they want to be able to penetrate potentially pretty deeply into the water to get to the fish that they've seen so these are towels when and you can see by the video that this bird is moving its nictitating membrane closing and opening and closing and opening it it's keeping its crest down and it even exhales if you want to call it that deflates its air sacs it's not really its lungs but it is kind of part of that before it dives those are tells that helps you anticipate when that bird's going to dive and if you can anticipate it you're going to do a lot better at getting that bird than you would if you are surprised by the bird diving because believe me <laughs> they are fast it takes maybe a second depending on how high off the water the bird is the perch is for the bird to get down catch a fish and come back up to the perch it can be about a second so you really get an advantage if you know the specific behaviors that tell you the bird is about to dive another example let's say uh, barred owls i don't have any video but i have a picture what barred owls generally do when they're going to fly is they generally turn or position themselves in the direction they're going to fly and then they generally crouch and then spring into uh, the air so if you see the bird turning maneuvering and then crouching that bird's going to fly almost always so that's a great tell for barred owls in general what do a lot of birds do before they fly I bet you something's popped into your head when i was talking about tells in the beginning here a lot of birds actually poop before they fly so it's poop and fly they want to get rid of all the weight they possibly can they want to be as efficient as efficient sorry as they can when they're uh, bef 
when they're flying. So the less weight, the more efficient they are when they're flying. So a lot of them poop and then fly. Not all the time do they poop before they fly and not all the time after they poop do they fly, but it is a great tell a lot of times if you're watching a bird, watching a bird, watching a bird, and it poops, you might want to be ready for it to fly. So again, I don't want to make these videos too long, so I'm not going to go into a bunch of specifics about this stuff. It's more to get you to understand the importance of knowing the behavior of these birds, knowing your subjects, knowing your birds, and how it can help you do better in your bird and flight photography so i'm not going to go into a ton of examples here but i just want to get the point across that the more you're in tune with your subjects with your birds the better bird photography you're going to do and the better bird and flight imagery you're going to get the best thing you can do is to spend time with the birds spend time with them where they don't care either they don't care that you're there or maybe they don't even know that you're there you want the be the birds to be undisturbed so they're doing what they normally do and if you can find scenarios like that get into scenarios like that and have the chance to really spend time with some of these birds and a lot of these behaviors will port over let's say to other species once you get a feel for what's happening with these birds and the behaviors that they have, you're going to be able to do a lot more anticipation, understand how the birds fly, when they fly, again, anticipate movements even in flight, and get better bird in flight images because of it. So I guess that's really all I wanted to, to get across in this video. And so if you found this video at all informative, please uh, think about subscribing because subscribing is what keeps me going here and keeps me doing these videos. And like always, I hope you stay safe. I hope you have great light. I hope you get great images. And until next time, see you soon.